operate the direct connection to you as being a taxpayer is to consider the EIN process, which brings you in at a different status uh, through a trust. Now, I still believe that that is um, the cleanest and simplest interface into their system, even though you are still declaring as a taxpayer that you are performing, uh, as, as we quoted, illegal acts, if you take their laws to their literal uh, meaning. So um, I don't think that we've made a mistake. What I think has been missing is that folk have been absolutely under huge stress, continual stress from the IRS, and even if you've had a win, people are still being hammered, and we haven't given enough insight into why the machine still comes at you even if you appear to have won. So I think that's all that's happening. We've added more information, not that information we've done before is wrong. So it was a bit of a long answer there, Terry, but I hope that answers the question. Well, I, I think that helps, uh, helps answer that question and shed you know, some interesting summary on it, on the where it comes about. Um, all right, now real quick, we're going to go to the phone lines, and just as a reminder to you, to those of you that would like to ask a verbal question on the phone, if you would press star eight, it puts you in the question queue, and we have West Maryland on the phone with a question. Are you there? Can you hear us? Uh, yes, uh, Cynthia in Maryland. Hey, Cynthia. I Hi. Hello. I uh, just want to let you know I've been recently reading the Maryland Laws at Large, and I encourage everyone to read your state laws at large from the 1600s to the 1700s, and your jaw will drop because it gives confirmation that the current titles and system in place today is the exact same one with maybe a few minor changes to what they had when they first occupied this territory. <laughs> yeah, that's really, really useful for, for people to go back and see what is on the public record. That's an excellent suggestion. Yeah, thank you, Cynthia. I'm glad you shared that, and I appreciate the email that you had sent out of, about that, too. That was really great information, and uh, that is a good thing for folks to do. You can actually just have affirmation as to what, what's happened and what's been going on. So thank you for that. Uh, All right. Uh, let's see. Cynthia, if you have anything else, uh, just do a story again. I'm sorry I muted you already. Um, Next question on the chat is, um, why do you have to bid against yourself? This is a, when you're speaking about bidding. Why do you have to bid against yourself as opposed to not having to be held liable for something you didn't do or uh, for some alleged charges or charge? Yeah, the, okay. It, I know that, that, that folks come from different angles when it comes to this, and I know that there are different opinions. For example, one of the strong opinions, and, and, and it is actually a correct one, that the court has no jurisdiction over the man is true. A court can only deal with corporations, and that's exactly what it does. It deals with persons. It doesn't deal with, with uh, men. And by the way, when I say uh, persons, the concept of natural person which gets thrown around, is an oxymoron. It's an absurdity. There's no such thing as a natural person. A person is a fiction. Therefore, it cannot be natural. There's nothing natural about a fiction. A fiction is unnatural. Therefore, the concept of natural person, which they slipped in there to describe the man, is an absolute absurdity. So and when people talk about, you know, I, I stand here as a man uh, before God or before the divine creator, and go down that particular route, that's fine. But if you find that a court ignores that and you are forced to move forward, then then it's kind of like fighting a losing battle. You're not bidding against yourself. You, you are bidding uh, on the matters of a person. They don't indict 
the, the man. An indictment, in fact, we give the definition of indictment. It's worth putting it up there. Let me just quickly read it out. Indictment is Article 139 of, of Cognitive Law. An indictment comes from, uh, where are, it's from two Latin words, uh, indicto, meaning to make known, show, indicate, especially to inform against, give evidence, to put a price on or value, and mentis. So indictment literally means to make known, inform against, to put a price on the mind. So when they issue an indictment, it's against the person. It's not against the man. So I think that's important. Uh, th their trick in court, one of their most important tricks, is for you to believe that it's all directed at you. It's not. It's directed at the person. And at the end, if you look at the meaning of the word judgment, and we didn't actually get to this. I'm sorry, Terry, I just got to quickly get through this. Article 141, judgment. Go and have a look at Article 141 of Cognitive Law. The meaning of judgment. Okay, the meaning of judgment is from two Latin words. Uh, I-U-G-O, or Yugo. I can't even know how they pronounce it in Latin, I'm sorry, which means to bind together connect couple and mentis so the meaning of judgment literally is to bind together the mind and presumably the flesh or the person so their trick is to get you at the very end of the course at the very end of the, the case I should say to accept that you are bound by the judgment but the whole process is against the person so I, I just be careful because there, there's a lot of good information and I'm not I'm not diminishing the importance of people's information but it's important when we're talking about this it's about the court going after the person and convincing the flesh the mind the mind the body the spirit to go surety and that's what they do okay yes well because they do not want to technically stand in there as the surety or trustee of something they created. So if they can get the, the man to do it, then that's just all the better for them. Well, exactly. And, and they don't want to deal with the man. They don't want to right. deal with the flesh. I mean, you know, once you do that, then you're getting back to Levitical law. You're getting back to the to real law, not all this rubbish law that they've got. And they want to still wear, wear, stay way, way clear of that. Because once you do that, there are spiritual implications and there are um, honourable implications. So when they're dealing in trust law, they can play. When they're dealing in statute law, they can play. They don't want to deal with a man. They can't deal with the flesh. It's all, it's all person. It's all corporate. Very good. Thank you, Frank. All right. Um, Jeff, next question from uh, Wolf Pass. I have cre I have completed the EDP process. Please talk about the steps for a 100-day process, sending a bill or liens, uh, accessing fruits of my CQB or uh, bond. Did you uh, touch on that a little bit? Very good. We originally when had the EDP process set up, um, a number of you probably recall that we included in that the perfection of a bill. And the bill, I think, originally was for the amount of $10 million. The The bill was removed from the, from the process, and I know that created some frustration. And, and in fact, I think a number of people um, lost interest when that, when that was removed. But there was a reason for removing it. And the reason wasn't that it was an imperfect process. Actually, what was there was the process to perfect a bill. It is their process to perfect a bill. But it was removed because it was distracting from the primary purpose of doing the ecclesiastical deed, which is to perfect your claim of right. Now, once you've completed the process and they have not responded, then that is the time to start the bill process. Now, given we are moving forward on August the 15th in launching the financial system, uh, I would like to see that we reintroduce that process again of how to perfect bills. 
but uh, it will be at the end of the process rather than being done in parallel to the perfection of the process of the ecclesiastical deed. Uh, I have to think about that and I'll have to come back to you, but those steps of how to perfect a bill and, and uh, what's involved is still there. There's nothing that is wrong with it. And in answer to your question, that's really what you're looking to do. But it was only removed because what was happening, and you, you probably don't recall what was happening. You may not have even been around looking at this when this was happening. But on the talk show, virtually every second question was about the bill and how to perfect the money and not about the ecclesiastical deed. So it was, over, it was overriding the purpose of what was going on. And that's the reason that we depreciated it. So I think it's time to see that be returned. Um, we're learning as we go. And, and certainly, uh, when you have perfected the process and there has been that extraordinary dishonor, then you have every right to monetize their sin. And that's exactly what they've done, to monetize their sin. All right? Yes, but thank you for that, Frank. Um, next question. How relevant is the Magna Carta? It's not. <laughs> There's a short answer for you. It's not relevant. Could you just go ahead and explain what happened and why it's not relevant? I I know the answer, but I'm for uh, the benefit, for everyone on the call and everyone that will be listening. See, many folks that have moved forward with assemblies, uh, Frank, have based the the uh, premise on Magna Carta and certain to jurisprudence. So, could you explain that a little bit? Sure. Look, I know that the Magna Carta is promoted as uh, a great historical document of um, of uh, freedom, uh, just as the Declaration of Independence is is raised. But uh, before we actually get to what happened in history in 1213 prior to the the Magna Carta, let's just look at a couple of things about the Magna Carta itself. If anyone believes that the Magna Carta was a document that has any application to you or I, then they need to go back and actually read who were the parties to it and what it said. Because when you read who the parties of the Magna Carta were and what it said, you realize that it had nothing to do with general freedoms. Nothing to do with general freedoms. It was a document designed to maintain power in the hands of the barons. It was a document that was designed to ensure that the powers of the lords, your landlords, your elite, could not be usurped by the crown. That is the primary purpose of the Magna Carta. And not one, and this is the incredible thing, not one of the clauses of the Magna Carta transposed down to us and none of it translated into being upheld in the law to the present day. So nothing survived of the Magna Carta legally and none of it was relevant to us and all it was about was the distribution of power of the elite for no benefit to men or women. So how on earth and that's the Magna Carta before we even talk about its history. How on earth that can be translated into freedom just shows you how we take on faith the propaganda and the disinformation and the mind influence they put on us. It's complete rubbish. In fact, the Magna Carta should be upheld as one of the worst documents of history, one of the most corrupt documents of history, one of the the most evil documents of history because it maintained the problem or claimed to maintain the problem. It didn't fix a single thing in terms of the rights of men and women. But in, in many things, they'll take uh, something and they'll turn it into something else. And it only survives because people won't read it. <laughs> now, there's a copy of the Magna Carta actually in Canberra. Uh, and I actually remember... Uh, one of the few places you can actually go and see it. It's an original, one of the original copies that was given as a gift to Australia. 
and for, for years you actually go and see it and actually 